Hello Internet, I'm Jackie Fox and this is Fox Talks Votive and this is a channel where I generally give PvP advice or just kind of some advanced player tips for the game War of Divisions in the FFB franchise. But today I'm going to do something completely different and I would totally appreciate as much audience participation in this as I can get because it has been years since I played Season 1 of FFBE, and what I'm going to be trying to do here today is to fill in all of the plot holes in both series by connecting the lore together using a, a bunch of little breadcrumbs that we have. This is going to start out with stuff that has already been confirmed through stuff like data mines or one-off uh, things that have been said. I'm also gonna connect this just a little bit to the lore of Final Fantasy set uh, Final Fantasy 7 and that larger kind of compilation universe specifically actually crisis core and remake um, but around halfway through we are gonna get to a point where it becomes a lot more just straight up theory crafting and even though I feel like I'm probably gonna be proven right, on this eventually, if not by the end of Season 2, by the end of Season 3, I think I've figured out exactly what Gilgamesh, Omnilus, a character that you probably don't even know their name, and Sodaly are up to. And also, we're gonna have two surprise guest stars from the FFBE canon, one of which we never really got to see, that are still yet to be revealed. So, with all of that out of the way, let's just get straight into the lore, and I'm going to start with Gilgamesh and Amnilus. So, I've been replaying the main story and investigating the lore surrounding Gilgamesh, and that's really what got me going down this rabbit hole. Here's what I have so far. Gilgamesh was formerly Veritas of the Frost, or Frost Lord one of a few soldiers made immortal through Aldor technology as a member of the Sworn Eight of Palladia. This is also, by the way, why Sakura is a 700-year-old child, which has probably been confusing a lot of people, although I'm, I'm guessing a lot of, like, people who didn't play FFB probably just assume that she's a normal age child. Anyways, Old Greg met Omnilus, one of the eight sages of Hess and the Veritas' mortal enemies in the war, though it's worth pointing out that the Veritas had a bit of a disagreement and Frostlord kind of fucked off to do his own thing, and that's really about the point in FFBE lore where we stop hearing about Frostlord, who, if you check out images of Frostlord or Veritas of the Frost, you'll see that he's holding like six or seven different weapons, so it definitely feels at home with this Gilgamesh theme. So she gifted him with new armor and his sword, the Excalibur, which has the ability to cut through dimensions like this is some kind of a Philip Pullman novel. Promptly he foxed off to Ardra to find to start a war that would bring about the end times or something. And actually, since I wrote this part, I have a completely different idea of what he is actually trying to do, although I'm not entirely sure why or to what end yet. Just to sidetrack a moment, this story development is actually really unique in Final Fantasy lore. Though Greg is one of the most iconic returning characters that isn't Sid, his story usually revolves around jumping dimensions in search of the sword Excalibur, often being faked out by the Excalibur, while our heroes of the story nab the real thing. To my knowledge, this is the first time we've seen Greg successfully complete this quest. And in War of the Visions, it seems to have made him an absolute tyrant. Back on track, most of this was explained in a very missable side quest from FFBE, and to my knowledge, I don't think this has been repeated. It may have been repeated once, but I think I actually played uh, when it could have been repeated, so I'm thinking this only happened once and it was years ago. Um, but there will be a link in the description to this, and, and really hasn't been mentioned in much detail. This is where we get the idea that Omnilus is the person who transformed Frostlord into what we now know as Gilgamesh. Although, even in this side quest, Omnilus isn't explicitly named. It's also worth noting, and this is probably some day one, like, iceberg stuff, but 
that Ardra is a continent on the world of Lapis, which is the world from Final Fantasy Brave Exvius. To quote from one of the wikis, the continent is, laid, is located south of Grand Shelt, to the east of Zoladad, and to the north of the realm of the Dragon King, which is where Bahamut is, by the way. For unknown reasons, by the time of Final Fantasy Brave Exvius, Ardra is surrounded by clouds and rendered inaccessible. No character from Ardra has appeared in Brave Exvius's main story, although I, I, I actually think this is slightly, slightly incorrect. Um, nor do any of the current kingdoms seem to have a diplomatic relationship with the rest of Ardra, leaving the circumstances behind its isolation undisclosed. Wotav is likely set before the events of FFBE, and I think I know exactly where in the timeline if my later theories are correct. The war is possibly the reason why Ardra doesn't appear in the plot, suggesting a very, very bad ending, or just honestly poor pre-planning for a side project coming years down the road. This makes our FFBE characters in WOTV time travelers, in a sense, although not actually Gil and Amnellus. It was noted that Rain and Fina in the FFB Universe crossover event are in Ardra as visions, which have the ability to exist independent of time or a character's status as dead or alive. As a vision user, this also means that King Mont could summon Elda for a comment or for a consult if he wanted to do so. It also theoretically means that Lord Mont could have summoned King Mont to aid him in battle, but I am getting way off topic here. These two characters are lifted from, or more so in Amnelis' case, heavily inspired by other Final Fantasy games. Gilgamesh is pretty obvious in this respect, but Amnelis is a little bit deeper in the lore. Personally, I think she's based on Minerva, a goddess in Crisis Core of Final Fantasy VII, and by extension the remake series as well. She's seen in Crisis Core bathed in shimmering light and is heavily symbolically associated with purple and yellow flowers. So with an eye for this, what do I notice when she's first introduced in Chapter 9, Scene 3? So this woman here that is referred to by the monks as the divine ruler, I think this is Amnelis, the sage. And I think that that's kind of why she has, um, and also by extension why Gilgamesh, have these god-level powers. Because they were essentially engineered beings that were created by a far advanced parallel world of Palladia. So how do I actually know her name as, like I'm pointing out, it's... it's not mentioned in FFBE, it's not mentioned in Global of WOTV, and to my knowledge, she is still unreleased and unmentioned in JP. But the short answer is JP Datamines. Also, her name, by the way, could be different by the time she reaches Global, so take that with a grain of salt. You know how JP names can be a little bit different than what they end up being in Global. But it does look like, from this state of mind, that her name will be Omnilus. She also makes an appearance in an art book as Mysterious Woman slash Slumbering Deity. Which, actually, the, the whole idea of her being a slumbering deity, even though we see her very much in the flesh, um, is kind of interesting to me. Making me think that potentially she's a vision, but uh, maybe I'll get into that in a future video. I haven't found any pictures of her from the actual art book, but I do suspect that this is one of them. Because I really can't figure out where else this picture would have come from. So contrast this with the color scheme and concept art from Minerva. I'm not sure this connection is actually all that relevant. I mean, I've been watching too many Sleep Easy videos, and by the way, if you're interested in super deep lore on Final Fantasy VII Remake, check their channel out. Amazing. But uh, after watching those, it wasn't hard to see a number of symbolic connections here. She also seems to be, uh, or at least connected to, an oracle, because she seems to be getting like these kind of divine forecasts and the ability to kind of tell the future. Minerva is a goddess mentioned in the play Loveless, which itself is a story about fate and predestination, which is a concept that fits rather nicely with oracles. After all, how could oracle powers work without fate and a certain level of predestination? 
You'll also notice yellow flowers throughout the stage, as well as a notable golden shimmer effect on her body, all of which further connects her to the canonical Minerva of Final Fantasy VII lore. Okay, so that's enough for Omnilus for right now, but it does give you enough to know that we can move forward. But for the moment, I want to talk about another Veritas, Veritas of the Light, who gets this really badass character art in the story. And also, Jaden just seems to know too much, but we're about to get into that. So as we know from FFBE, Veritas of the Light, from here on, I'm gonna probably call her Citra, so, you know, get over it. Uh, followed the Sworn Six, Frost Lord, Greg, Bolt Lord, Sakura had all left the group by this point, and Reagan had as well, but that doesn't count for reasons I'm not even gonna get into here, because they are their own can of worms. Um, to the part of Lapis that we know from FFBE, given that WOTB starts, takes Mm. Actually, I'm not sure that this is the case. So, I think a lot of people are assuming that perhaps, um, especially people who know about the Frost Lord Gilgamesh connection, might be assuming that, you know, Gilgamesh immediately start uh, put these actions into play when he crossed the dimensional barrier between Palladia and stepped into Ardra, but I'm thinking that he took a couple hundred years. I'll get more into that in a little while. But I'll get more into that in a minute. So, with our assumption that War of Divisions takes place 600 years before FFBE, and again, I'm not sure that that's true, but let's roll with it for now, Citra will likely never appear as part of Ardra's story in a direct way, though, given that Ardra isn't far away, it could happen. Especially because she specifically is so invested in the Sworn Six and their plan in FFBE, which likely doesn't involve Ardra. But since Ardra is likely isn't home to any of... Oh. <laughs> oh, man. I, I have learned some shit. Wow, it's crazy reading back through this, because I was wrong on some things, I think. Anyways, I'm just going to keep reading it as it is, and then I'm going to tell you what I was wrong about later on. So... <sighs> So their plan in FFBE likely doesn't involve Ardra because Ardra likely isn't home to any of the crystals they were after. Though, and I point this out because it's long been loose thread in FFBE lore, like a lot of the things that I'm going to be discussing here, with the eight elements we only ever see six crystals. Hmm. It is possible that the other two are situated in Ardra, and... It seems like one of these is probably already broken because, you know, Omnilus. Like, unless she is projecting herself as a vision from her crystal and projected herself into Palladia to, you know, mess with Gilgamesh, um, it seems like her crystal was probably broken first, at which point she enlisted Gilgamesh to do the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So it's possible that we have a crystal here, and it's also possible that the Sworn Six might venture here to destroy them. Although, if we're assuming that the Lightning Crystal's already destroyed, and it may well be, then actually from FFBE lore, we know that Reagan is supposed to be the person who breaks the Ice Crystal. So... man, I... nah... It's, it's so hard not to give away the game here, you guys, but stick around, stick around, because this is going to get crazy. <sighs> Anyways, somehow this didn't stop Jaden from summoning Citra's armored form to take down Greg in Chapter 10, Season 1 of War the Visions. Now, this begs a lot of questions. Firstly, how does he even know about her? I'm not exactly sure that he has to to summon her. I'm not entirely sure what the the lore on summoning visions is, although from what I remember from FFBE, um, and this doesn't necessarily explain how visions can travel through time, but 
but uh, we're, we're talking about a character that shouldn't have been in Ardra at any point, unless... Oh man, oh man, oh wow. You know, once I found out some of this stuff, I just started making a lot of connections here. But if we know that Omnilus's crystal has been destroyed, we have to ask ourselves, how did that happen? And it seems like the answer is likely the Sworn Six. I mean, as we see them in FFB, their, um, their, their journey, their quest seems to be to destroy all eight of the crystals. So let's say they got started a little bit early and got the lightning one first, wherever that happens to be, Ardra or otherwise. This could have potentially given Jaden a chance to meet Citra and the rest of the gang, potentially. So, I'm not... I'm assuming that this isn't just a throwaway summon. I mean, it's a pretty iconic character from Season 1 of FFBE, and one that is very important and has a lot of connections even to Wotiv lore. In addition to that, there's a lot implied here, such as Jaden understanding a lot more about Gilgamesh's history than anyone pro other than probably the characters that I have mentioned above should. Otherwise, why would he summon another member of the Veritas to take down someone who is formerly one of the Veritas? I mean, it's actually really fitting for him to summon her, given their mutual use of guns, but how does he know about the Veritas to begin with? I mean, Gilgamesh, I understand, but Citra likely hasn't visited Ardra. So here is what may be a more likely hypothesis, or at least what I thought might have been a more likely hypothesis. What if Jaden traveled to the part of Lapis we know from FFB? As mentioned above, it's potentially not that far away. And as mentioned above, it's not really all that far away, and the current story at the beginning of Season 2 of Wotiv shows us that Rundle has access to a pretty fancy looking ship that could definitely make it to the world of FFBE canon. So, <laughs> whew, even though I have almost spoiled the rest of this, let's get into some of the parts that are a lot more speculative. And let's start with Seymour and the Far East. After the events above, Seymour shows up out of nowhere and saves Greg's ass. He also seems to know a little bit too much himself, but not nearly on the same level as Jaden. It's implied that a lot of the game samurai... Uh, it's implied that a lot of the game's samurai come from the quote-unquote Far East, but depending on your reference point, Far East couldn't mean Lapis that we know from FFBE, as that's either to the north, the south, or the west, meaning the only direction it couldn't be is east. Here's another yet undisclosed location in Lapis that we haven't seen in either game. So he's from an undisclosed location in Lapis that we haven't seen so far in either game. Also, the Far East did come up in a side quest, but sadly this doesn't seem to clarify much of anything. Here's what I'm thinking. What if Lapis is actually a really small world? I mean, a lot of the worlds in FFB's universe seem pretty small, at least, or at least, unaware of what surrounds them. So, what if traveling far east from Ardra actually lands you on the western area of the largest map of Lapis that we know? If so, you'd end up in Farm. This, by the way, is the description of Farm from the game. Farm, politically the kingdom of Farm, is the southwestern continent and is based on feudal Japan with its many martial artists, samurai, and ninjas. I also found a map that creates some not insurmountable issues for this theory and actually kind of led me in a different direction. But if you travel east of Ardra, that are, there are actually a number of islands. So, this may still be true if we consider these islands east, but also if we assume that this is a full map of the world of Lapis, that could also make Farm 
far east. Of course, the idea of something being far is relative. I mean, for all I know, the people of Ardra could consider Wazette to be east. I mean, it is on Ardra's east coast. So if that's the case, then Far East would reference the islands to the east of Wazette. Another theory goes like this, based on something that I found in Farm's history. Odagiri, through instructions of her master in order to unify the land, uni utilized a mix of deception, trickery, and manipulation tactics, managed to end the life of the clan, leaving Hayate, the only survivor, who fled with Kaede, to a town far away, with... with... damn. Within the nation's borders. Okay. Hmm. Where they restarted their lives as a family. Man, I misread that the first time. Okay. So, this actually kind of... And, and this... Wow. Okay, this kind of makes sense, though. Um, because I have also heard in... I think it was his character descriptions for, like, his six-star form in FFBE, it mentions that after Chizuru's suicide, his mother... Um, you know, after being disgraced by Odagiri, um, Chizuru, being a good samurai, commits seppuku. And Miyuki, um, I think it's Hayate's daughter, who did some messed up stuff and ends up pursuing, like, the dark arts or something. She wanders off. And we don't really know where she goes. I haven't actually looked into Mizuru's connection in this because, man, you can only dive through so much FFBE lore in like one day. But, so here's what I'm thinking. What if Miyuki ended up on these islands to the east of Ardra? And eventually, Hayate, and Hayate who we know... Um, towards before the end of his life went wandering outside the borders of farm to look for her what if he and you know his new family went to these islands and started a new clan of samurai now you're right to mention that at least Hayate I'm not really sure how to describe um, Kayede other than a chocobo knight which is pretty awesome but uh, Hayate was a ninja. However, he was trained by his mother in the ways of the samurai, so that is something that he could and may even want to pass on uh, to the next generations. So maybe Hayate and Kaede and their extended family populated these islands and started a samurai culture there. And then eventually those samurais wandered to the west and ended up in Ardra. And that's how we get characters like Seymour and Sir O. But that I'm not as sure about. Exactly where the Far East is something that I still can't pin down and really tie to any specific lore. But we have finally got to the point in the video where I'm going to make an attempt to just completely spoil Season 2. Okay, so, <coughs> so if you're not down for that, just, uh, I don't know, click off the video now. But if you're interested in hearing my theory crafting about it, let's get into it, because it all revolves around the eight crystals. In FFBE, there are six elemental crystals that seem, that seem to correspond to the eight elements, and lore states that two of the crystals, the ice and lightning crystals, were destroyed long ago. We know that the crystals were used to trap the eight sages of Hess, and that the lightning crystal should be home to Amnilus. So assuming that she's not a vision, as the events of WOTV begin, I'm going to assume that the lightning crystal is destroyed already because Amnilus appears to be free. This leaves only one crystal unaccounted for. Ice. Following the story pattern of FFBE, this crystal houses Rowan, which is Laswell's biological father, and would be connected to Gilgamesh, because he used to be Frostlord. 
for whatever reason, and I think it's it was kind of just a stylistic decision, you encounter each of the Veritas at the corresponding elements shrine, which houses that element's crystal. Kind of like a protector, but actually they're trying to destroy them. But anyways, typically the Veritas are associated with the crystal of their element, which means that Gilgamesh, formerly being the Veritas of the Frost, would be associated with the ice crystal. So, that really makes me think... <laughs> well, hold on, we'll get into that in a second. We know a few things about elemental crystals. They are apparently different from the ones that Sodaly is mining, as they keep Lapis in balance, and they contain a power that can spur an entire continent, like Ardra, for example, into a sort of new age. And each of them is the prison of one of the eight sages. So here's the part where I take a swing at spoiling season two. Gilgamesh, and Sodaly as well, probably wish to use this crystal to bring about a new age in Ardra, though what this new age looks like probably varies greatly between their two visions of the future. Just to give you kind of some idea of what kind of power these crystals hold, um, one of the points of lore that I remember from Season 1 of FFBE was that Zoladad, which housed the fire crystal, used it to make incredibly powerful airships. And I'm talking like a world that doesn't really have that many airships where this kind of technology is pretty new, and all of a sudden they are just coming out of nowhere with these immensely powerful flying warships. That, that really they shouldn't have the power to create. So, I mean, he could be trying to recreate like the level of technology and magical advancement of, a, of his home, Palladia. That could be Gilgamesh's motive, and uh, Sodaly's just fucking crazy. He might be trying to bring his former love back to life. I'm not really sure what his motivation is. I think he's just, just like diabolical. <laughs> I'm not really able to get a read on him. With War of the Visions seemingly set in FFB's past, we can assume that this will ultimately lead to the Ice Crystal's destruction, which releases Rowan. So, by the end of Season 2, we might meet Laswell's dad, is this how the next story arc will end? You tell me. But actually, this, this goes even deeper, and I'm even more certain than I was before that we will ultimately meet Reagan at some point in this story. So, this is Rain's dad and Laswell's adoptive father. And here's a bit of lore that supports this. Reagan spent centuries trying to find his friend before unsealing him. Rowan had amnesia and had forgotten how to fight. Rowan explained who he is, or Reagan explained who he is, but was unable to make him remember much of his former life. So, if the crystal over Leonis is the ice crystal, it seems that Reagan will be the one to crack that bad boy open. So, Reagan, possibly even as the Veritas of the Dark, but most likely not, will at some point show up and break his old friend out of this crystalline prison, probably by joining forces with Mont. Now, there is one more thing, and this is actually a point of lore that I really need to look further into. I'm going to be re-watching uh, the cutscenes of some of the relevant chapters of WOTV to, to actually figure this out, but um, I remember numerous times both Sodaly and Gilgamesh referring to the crystal as something of an egg. Which is which is weird, but if you think about an egg, it is a thing that potentially has a life within it. It's it's kind of another way of, you know, referring to a prison that may house someone as an egg. Because you crack it open and, you know, a little baby pops out. Only in this case, the baby <laughs> He's Rowan's dad, and he's not actually a baby, but, you know, whatever. So, if, if all of this craziness 
is true. About the end of season two, or maybe even season three. The, I'm not sure how, how long they're going to drag it out, but I really feel like this part of the FFB lore was perhaps, un, uh, perhaps intentionally left ambiguous so that it could be explored in a later prequel game. And if that's the case, then we will eventually, as a part of War of the Visions, see the breaking of the ice crystal. And if I had to put down a candidate for the ice crystal, it's the one hanging over Leonis right now. This also suggests that War of the Visions is actually a lot closer to the FFB timeline than we've generally been thinking, or as I suggested earlier in the video, because FFBE lore seems to give Rowan a relatively short life after being freed, and since Laswell is probably somewhere around his 20s in FFBE, this could put the stories within somewhere between a century to a few decades of each other. But, for right now, that's all I've got. I know, it's been 30 minutes of me just dropping this harebrained collection of theories um, based on all sorts of obscure lore. But, <laughs> I don't know, man. To me, it all fits together too well. And, like, the more I look into it trying to disprove myself and trying to find things that conflict or disagree with the ideas that I have, the more I actually end up stumbling into things that uh, change my perspective and give me an even clearer vision of what this story is going to be like. And actually it makes me appreciate the game a lot more in a way. Because, I don't know, <laughs> there have been certain parts of FFB lore that have always felt like plot holes to me. Like, like the six crystals with eight elements. Like, where the, what happened to the other two? Why didn't we get to see that? But this would actually explain that. And furthermore, like, Sodley, Gilgamesh, Omnilus especially, are super mysterious. Like, they've been characters for chapters and chapters and chapters now. We've had ample opportunity to really get an idea of what these folks are doing, but really, we don't know that much. So, now that I get, by looking at what is still unexplained about FFBE lore, and how that connects to the elements that are unexplained about the WOTV lore, I really think that what they're going to be doing in Season 2, and maybe Season 3, is connecting the two storylines together. And, you know, we may even get to see some things that have only been kind of hinted at in, like, um, kind of flashbacky side quests in FFBE. Like, Rowan in general. I mean, he, he died before FFBE started. I don't even think Glasswell was originally aware that he was the child of Rowan. I think he actually thought that either he didn't know his father, he thought that Reagan was actually his biological father because, you know, Reagan's been raising him since he was a little kid. So, you know, maybe we actually get to see these three missing characters that should be super foundational to FFB lore maybe we'll actually finally get to see their story and something uh, more in-depth than just a side quest. Anyways, at least that's what I'm hoping for. Whew. Yeah, this, this has been a long one. And look, man, it is hot. And I am absolutely pouring sweat at this point because I had to turn off all my fans to uh, kind of eliminate as much background noise as I could. And, um, I don't know, if you, if you enjoyed this, you can, you can definitely help me out by either contributing what you know about the deep nooks and crannies of FFBE or Wotif lore, or by sending me some money on Patreon or coffee as a way of saying thank you for 
what looks like a stupid amount of time that I am going to be spending researching two mobile games for whatever reason. <laughs> but uh, if you would like to see this project continue, if you would like to see me get to some definite answers, uh, sending me some monetary support would definitely be a way to ensure that that's going to happen. Oh man, you guys, I thought I was done. But this lore keeps dragging me back in. So there's a there's another thing that while I was looking for pictures to make this video or kind of podcasty thing that I'm doing here, because eventually there will be a video once I understand this better, and I'm gonna work in some of the video sources and actually like some of the cutscenes from Wotiv into this. But there is something I stumbled across that actually adds like an interesting extra level of depth here. So, there is a side quest, um, like a side story that happens, and also maybe uh, cements the idea that Wotiv is happening just a few decades or so, or maybe, you know, a century, but, but not like an extended period of time before FFBE. So, like... It's only pretty soon before the events of Season 1 of FFBE that the Sworn Six actually stumbles upon the, uh, like the mystical library or some, some nonsense like that. And that's where they learn that by destroying the crystals they might be able to open a portal and get back to Palladia. Well, as a part of this storyline, or a storyline very very similar or close in time to this. Um, Reagan actually shows up to the group as Frostlord, and the way that he does this is by wearing Frostlord's armor. Now, this is kind of a conflicted point of lore, um, which is why I didn't mention it before, and I wasn't really certain until I remembered this side quest, which was actually the first side quest I ever played in FFBE, by the way. I remember it very fondly. Um, but th there were parts of lore that say that Frostlord's armor was lost, and yet it shows up in this side quest, which really begs the question, how did Reagan get his hand on Frostlord's armor. So, just to, like, cap this off with another wild prediction, if we're already predicting that Reagan is going to show up and destroy the ice crystal above Leona's castle, this would be in direct contradiction of the goals of Gilgamesh, which would put them at odds. So it's not entirely out of the question to say that Reagan may end up, you know, fight to the death with his former compatriot, Gilgamesh. And if that happens, it gives Reagan this opportunity to claim Frostlord's armor and take it back with him to Lapis, where he ends up hiding it for safekeeping. Or at least the part of Lapis we know from FFB. It's all Lapis, but whatever. I think the idea of Reagan killing Gilgamesh, or at least defeating him in some way, kind of reverting him to his normal form, maybe reverting him to his Veritas armored form, in which case he says, well, you know what, I give up, you can have the armor, whatever. I have no idea how that's going to play out in specifics, but that general idea of Gilgamesh being defeated in battle by Reagan at, at kind of like the climax of season two definitely explains how this lost suit of armor ended up in Reagan's possession even after Frostlord was um, like split off from the rest of the Sworn Eight in the events in Palladia. So I don't know. I don't know, man. It, it seems like there are a lot of unexplained points of lore that point to Reagan not only having a climactic battle with Gilgamesh, but also destroying the ice crystal, which very well 
may be the crystal that is currently hanging over Leona's castle in our current world of storyline. But look, y'all, I'm just gonna have to continue this in a future video. This has gone on way too long. Just, just let, let me, let me, let me end it with that. I, I, I appreciate y'all for listening. Look, hit me up with any information you might have, even if it's contradictory to this, even if you think that, like, I got a piece of lore wrong, and, and I may well have. I mean, again, it's been a long time, but from what I remember and from what I've been able to look up, this is really the only thing that makes sense, so I, I, I'm really interested in hearing people's feedback on this, so uh, hit me up. See you next time.